The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our fifth Issues in National Security lecture held here in the virtual world. I'm John Jackson and I will serve as the host for today's event. To kick off our event, I'd like to call on Rear Admiral Chatfield to extend her greetings. Hello all, thank you for joining us again for our Issues in National uh, Security. And I'm joined here by my husband, David Scoble. And uh, we are so inspired to see you online and to share with you some of these wonderful gifts that we have from our faculty members. And we're looking forward to the lecture today. Thank you very much, Admiral David. To uh, begin, I'd like to just mention that uh, anyone who's joining us for the first time, I'd like to reiterate that this series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and friends here in the Newport area. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport and indeed around the world. We will be offering 13 additional lectures between now and May of 2021 spaced about two weeks apart. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our public affairs office. On Tuesday, 10 November 2020, we will feature a lively discussion on ethics and emerging military technology with Professor Tom Creeley. Each event will consist of three parts, the scholarly speaker's presentation, a question and answer period, and then a brief pause before we proceed to the family discussion group session. This final segment is of primary interest to family members residing here in Newport and will feature guest speakers from various support activities and organizations on base. Okay, now on with the main event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom and we'll get to them at the conclusion of the presentation. I'm now very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Holmes. Jim is one of the most prolific writers at the college and is known by almost everyone in the maritime security business. He holds the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy here at the Naval War College, and he previously served on the faculty of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs. A former U.S. Navy surface warfare officer, he was the last gunnery officer in history to fire a battleship's big guns in anger during the first Gulf War in 1991. He earned the Naval War College Foundation Award in 1994, recognizing him as the top graduate in his class. The latest version of his widely read book, Red Star Over the Pacific, is a primary selection on the Chief of Naval Operations professional reading list. Most recently, he published a brief guide to maritime strategy. I'm not exactly sure why, but former Secretary of Defense James Madison, James Mattis considers him troublesome. His talk this afternoon will explain why it is so hard for the U.S. Navy to prevail in strategic competition or warfare in the Pacific, even though it reigns, remains stronger than its competitors. He will review the geography, naval budgets, combat capability, and much, much more to show why the strong need not and may not necessarily win. I'm pleased to pass the digital baton to a friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Holmes. Oh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't unmute myself. I was being too good. Too good a host. Just. Uh, I was just saying. I would like to, uh, to to give a shout out to uh, Porter uh, Porter Halliburton and Tom Feddersen out there. And I see them on my main screen here. So it's uh, it's great to see you all. This, I think, is the best timing I have ever had for to give this talk, uh, being the week before Halloween and also the week before the election. And I think you'll, and I hope you'll see why I think the timing is really good. So 
the, I mean, I mean, the, really, the question that we're going to explore tonight is how much sea power is enough? It's a, it's a recurring theme in election years. It's a, it's, a, it's a recurring theme in our field all of the time. Uh, most recently, uh, Secretary of Defense Esper has, pr has proposed something he calls Battle Force 2045, which calls uh, by mid-century or thereabouts for, for the Navy to be about 500 ships, including, uh, including about 355 manned ships, sort of traditional type warships, uh, in, a, in a large contingent of optionally manned or, or unmanned craft. And I think, well, and so that's, that's really sort of the subtext that we're talking about when we, when we get into this question of how to measure naval power, both objectively in the sense, in the sense that we look at ourselves and then subjectively as we, as we measure ourselves against prospective enemies. And of course, to the, the prospective enemy I want to spend time on tonight would of course be China. How do we make ourselves strong enough to deter China in its own backyard, yard, which, which requires the ability to defeat China in its own backyard? Even, even if we are better on a platform for, for, for platform and person for person basis within the sea services, I think that it's it's still a really hard thing to do to go into somebody else's onto somebody else's home turf and overpower them there and make yourself stronger and accomplish your political objectives. So that's sort of that's sort of the way that I'm coming at this topic. So let's go. Let's just go ahead and dive right into it. This uh, this project goes out back about ten years when uh, Professor Yoshihara, whom most of you are probably familiar with, uh, unfortunately left us about three years ago to to, to, get to return to the think tank world. But we got a, we got a, a sort of a strange seeming request uh, from a an outlet in Korea, South Korea, uh, called Global Asia. And they said, "Hey, would you write a piece explaining how to count, how to measure the strength of a navy?" And that was, and it really became sort of a sort of a fun project. This is this is the, the, the first page of that article, which uh, appeared, I think, about uh, December two thousand ten, if I remember right. And we went through a lot of the things that I'm going to go through with you tonight. So I want to share that with you and help you help you think about these things as well. We don't have and no, but none of us, least of all me, has any definite answers to all of these things. But we can at least reason together and try to and try to figure out how to look at these matters together. And hopefully find collective wisdom as we as we vote next week and as we try to shape to help our elected leaders shape uh, policy and strategy in the future. One thing you'll find when you start getting into the when you start getting into these discussions, you will feel like this guy, Rick Grimes, the zombie hunter from from The Walking Dead. Fame. I'm not even sure if that uh, show is still on anymore. We we sort of fell out of love with it a few years ago. But I mean, if you think about it, if you read zombie books or if you if you watch the watch the movies. It's really, really hard to fight zombies. You shoot one down with a shot to the head, and ten more or a hundred more come just like it come behind it, and you have to shoot. You have to shoot those down as well. You, you know, ultimately, you expend your ordnance, and they get you. I mean, at, at that point, you're at that point, you're a lost cause, and you probably become one of them. You will feel like this when you get into arguments about naval power and military power, because you hear the same things over and over again. You can rebut them as many times as you want, and ten, and ten more times somebody will come back, come back the next election cycle or, or whenever the, the topic of naval affairs comes up, the, the, these same things will come up over and over again. You know, I, I should, I should uh, hasten to add these fallacies about how to, me how to measure sea power None of them is entirely wrong. And in fact, in fact, there is value to all of them, but using them individually as, as a one size fits all indicator of how much sea power is enough is deeply misleading. And so I, so I, want, to, I want to put that case to you in the next hour. And hopefully, hopefully during the Q&A, we, uh, we can reason this out and, uh, and figure out how we, how we can do things better. So my agenda is a pretty straightforward one. As I said, I wanted to look at us. I want to look at our strategy and our force structure and budgets a little bit. And then I want to flip it around and, and try to put that force structure to work in, in the Western Pacific vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis a, a growing and incre increasingly muscular and increasingly assertive China. All you have to do is survey the daily, the, the daily news headlines and you will, real, re, you will quickly realize that China is going, growing increasingly comfortable with throwing its weight around in the Western Pacific. So first of all, Let's, let's look at our strategy. What is our strategy in the, in the Asia Pacific or in the Indo-Pacific as we've taken to calling it in the last few years? Well, I think you can reach, well, in fact, you can reach out back even beyond the Obama administration that for a long time after the Cold War, uh, we, we sort of took a strategic holiday. We didn't do a whole lot. But, it, but, but, but one thing we did was realize that the Pacific was going to be important. So even during uh, President Bush, Bush the second uh, reign, you started seeing more and more submarines transferring out into the, into the Pacific and making their home ports there to the extent that by about 2006, 60% of the submarine fleet was already in the Pacific. 
the Obama administration comes out, comes after that, as I will review for you in a few minutes, and makes it formal. It says we will pivot or rebalance to Asia. We will unbalance the force structure so that we have more forces at our disposal to match up with, with what we hope to accomplish in the, in the Western Pacific, which is big things. We have great ambitions as we have for many decades. So that's a that, that's sort of a shorthand for what, and I think that, and I, I know we I know we think of uh, President Trump's administration as being radically different from from its predecessors, and I and certainly they have dropped a lot of the same language. But if you read between the lines, look at the strategic documents that have come out during this this administration, I think there's a lot there's a lot of continuity, which is kind of a heartening thing in these eras in which bipartisanship seems uh, very elusive. Kind of it's kind of good to see that we can all agree agree on some big things in the in the policy and strategy world. To look for to look for statements about what U.S. Mar U.S. maritime political objectives are out in the Pacific, you can look at documents like these. Uh, the, the one to the left, which was which came out in October 2007, right on right on the stage in Spruance Auditorium here at the college, was a, it, it set for it was our first formal maritime strategy since the 1980s. And I will review a little bit with you what what that said because I think that actually set the tone that set the tone and actually it sets. Uh, several threads of continuity that you see flowing through strategic documents ever since. The, the, the document to the right was, is the, is the, is the uh, 2015, what they called the refresh, sort of an updated and revised version of that. Uh, it's a lot longer. It's, I don't find it as user friendly. So I will actually revert back to the 2007 document uh, as, as sort of the, gui the guidance for the pivot. I will, I will tell you, I, I, my, I understand that there is a new maritime strategy in the works, and I think we may see that pretty soon. So the, this, lecture will, the, this lecture will be uh, possibly very different next year. So that, I think that's in the works so for some time, uh, potentially by the end of the year. Okay, what are the basic what are the basic trends in U.S. In U.S. maritime strategy in the Western Pacific? And I said, as I said, I'm reaching back to 2007 here. The, the three, I think, the three most striking things in that in that document, which was a nice, short, little, punchy very user-friendly document were this. First of all, the United States reserves unto its, the right unto itself to maintain credible combat power in the Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and the Persian Gulf. So it's sort of the wider Indo-Pacific uh, uh, basin plus the Persian Gulf. And that, that, that was widely interpreted by, by, the, by the framers of that strategy as well as meaning that we intend to remain number one in the, in the region for the foreseeable future. So that's, and which leads to the second point that I've uh, highlighted there. We, will, we reserve unto ourselves also the right to take local sea control at times and places of our, of our own choosing alone if need be. So whatever expanse of water we need control of in that, in that uh, region, we're gonna go and grab it, preferably with allies and friends, but alone if need, if need be. Pretty striking, th pretty striking thing. We, we talk about Mahan, and it, you, I know you all have uh, heard from John Maurer about Mahan. He was all about command of the sea. But he was thinking mostly in regional terms, mostly about the Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the, and the waters off our eastern and western coasts. This takes Mahan to a whole nother, another whole nother level, but basically saying we'll do this anywhere on the face of the earth that we need to, but especially in the Indo-Pacific region. So a really, a really uh, breathtaking statement of purpose coming out of the Navy, Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, the, the, the three signatories to this document. And lastly, the, the documents, and this was the, the part that occasioned, I think, the most, the, the most uh, buzz among commentators on maritime strategy, but it did explicitly make, make plain what we already knew, which is that the United States sees itself as the lead custodian of the system, the system being uh, the system of freedom of the sea, uh, freedom, of the, uh, freedom to use the sea for um, Military and military and commercial purposes, in co in concert with friends and allies, of whom we hope to to recruit a lot, so that we could so that we could have more uh, uh, forces available to police the sea against counter -prolifer for uh, against proliferation against terrorism and all these sorts of things. So this made it this made it formal that the United States contends that it is the steward of the maritime system at sea, the liberal order at sea. So, like I said, a pretty a pretty bold st statement of purpose coming out of the Bush administration that carried over, as I said, into the Obama administration, in which uh, uh, in which the Obama Pentagon in 2015 released this document, the Asia Pacific Maritime Security Strategy. I was totally stoked when I opened this up on my screen in my office that day and saw this on page one: "Why we safeguard freedom of the seas." Man, page one right there. It's all it's all about it's all about defending the seas against not only not only lawbreakers, whether lawbreakers, whether it's gun runners or human traffickers or whatnot, but also but also potentially state challengers to free use of the seas. 
Wonderful. That was a that was a great tone setter for that document, and which is why I dumped it right into this thing. Yeah, and highlighted it quite quite nicely. So again, you, you do see that sort of continuity. This is a, this is basically the Obama people's uh, or the Obama administration's way of stating we are all about preserving the system. So that, this was their way of saying it. I actually think they said it even a bit better. Freedom of the seas is uh, freedom of the seas is really important, and it is a lot more than freedom of navigation. The term that you that you uh, normally hear. Uh, for when we do, for, for when we go make demonstrations at the Taiwan Strait or the South China Sea or whatever the case may be, just to go, just to close out this opening section about strategy, just to just to just to point out that there is continuity from administration to administration. The, here's the here's the Indo-Pacific. I'm not sure we call it why we call it a strategy report exactly, but it's basically the Department of Defense Indo-Pacific strategy. And here we go, right uh, right on page one. The Indo-Pacific is the, is DoD's priority theater. And the, the, the nomenclature, which you see down there below, they, they've taken to say it's instead of freedom of the seas, it's a free and open Indo-Pacific in which all nations can, can partake of maritime freedom and all the all the blessings that go with a liberal international system. So again, sort of uh, different, different on the rhetorical side, but not really a whole lot different on the substance, if at all. What does that translate into in real terms? I, I already, I already uh, when I introduced the pivot, the rebalance to Asia, in more force structure terms, it, 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 it amounts to a 60-40 split in the force structure between, between surface ships and uh, uh, naval aviation and, all, and all, the, all the branches of uh, US naval power. Which uh, which is a good thing. I mean, it's uh, I mean I'm glad to see it's glad it's good to see Washington un under successive administrations realize the importance of the region and realize that, that if we have big ambitions in this important region, that we need to allocate more region more resources to that in order to match policy with strategy with resources and accomplish our goals. So, but I mean that do that does leave a rather large question unaddressed. Is that enough? I mean, just be, I mean, that's an input measure. We're saying, so, okay, we're going to put 60% in the in the region. That's fine, but is that enough? If it's not enough to defeat China or deter Russia or whatever the case may be, then at that point, we really have to uh, do some soul searching and figure out what we're going to do. Whether it's to augment the forces as a whole, whether it's to swing more forces from the Atlantic into the into the Indo-Pacific, whatever the case may be. So that's a that's a big question that we should always be bearing in mind, and that's where you start running into zombies. They're going to start attacking you when you start uh, delving into these matters. So hopefully, hopefully this fence will open. This this fence will hold, so you don't ex expend all your ordnance trying to gun them down. Okay, the first zombie, the first uh, the first fa fallacy that I think you will encounter when you talk about naval power, and again, this is a partial truth, not it's something that's uh, totally totally wrong at all. But that's a, I mean, this is the idea. And I'm stating it more clearly than you'll hear it. That the idea that he who he who spends the most on defense wins. How many times? How many times out there in the press? In fact, you can get into your favorite search engine and you can find you can dig up any number of graphics to go along with this one. This one's sorry. This one's from the last election cycle in 2016. Look at that. Look at that headline. This this, this remarkable chart shows how U.S. defending dwarfs the rest of the world. Dwarfs the rest of the world. And the, the, the point being that the United States spends uh, about the same as the combined 14 next competitors, many of whom are our friends, uh, along, with, along with China and Russia and, and other uh, potential antagonists. Man, so, so, the, so the takeaway is that if we spend that much, we must be able to win because we, because we must have bought so much stuff, more stuff, more, so many more sailors, soldiers, sailors, and airmen and all that kind of stuff, that if we apply that resource or those resources against any potential foe, we are going to win. And again, that make, that does make a certain amount of sense. You should be able to buy more military power with uh, if you spend more on it. But think, but think about what uh, what that uh, what what all that defense spending you know about about three quarters of a tw trillion dollars goes into every year. We buy a lot of really expensive stuff. This is the this is the USS Zumwalt, the first of a new class of stealth destroyers that's uh, that's now out in San Diego. Stopped off here on its way to San Diego from Bath, Maine, a few years ago. Uh, and had us on board on board for tours, which was really kind of cool. This thing this thing goes for about four billion dollars a copy, and there's only going to be three of them because they're so darn expensive. We were going to get thirty some of them, and uh, you, you you progressively saw the number go down and the unit costs go up. So that's a, so again that's a, that really helps eat into that defense budget pretty fast. Here's, this is the USS Gerald R. Ford, the first of a new class of uh, of uh, aircraft carriers, nu nuclear powered aircraft carriers. This thing goes for about $13 billion a copy, and that's without putting planes, without putting sailors, without putting stores and ammunition on board, all of which will, of course, add to the operating costs of that thing. So, again, that's a that's a big chunk of change. 
speaking of putting an air wing on there, it's, a, it's going to carry, it's going to carry all, eventually uh, these F-35 Joint Strike Fighters, stealth fighters. If you, if you look at DOD, the figures out of the DOD, the different services that are going to operate that, the Navy, Marine Corps, and the Air Force, this thing goes for well upwards of $100 billion per copy. Multiply that by the, by a couple of squadrons, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, you know 12, 12 planes per squadron or whatever the figure is, that that's, uh, that really adds up quite a bit as well. But that's not all. I mean, these are these are uh, these are forces that we use to go out and do battle for the command of the sea. At the same time that is happening, we're also trying to recapitalize, basically replace an entire class of nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. The ones they built when I, when I and Captain Jackson were in uniform way back when, uh, the Ohio class are now reaching the end of their service lives by the end of this decade or thereabouts, and we have to replace them. The Navy has made no bones about it. These are ships that we cannot do without, and they are very expensive also, $7 billion a copy for 12 boats, so $84 billion right there. And uh, in fact, if anybody's uh, sitting alongside the Narragansett Bay, if you can look over towards Quonset Point, it's part, of, part of those boats are being uh, assembled right there. And and of course, down a uh, hop, skip, and jump down the road at Groton is where they're being assembled. So kind of neat, just kind of neat to see this major project going on right here in our own backyard. But again, a bit this is a bit this is a major expenditure. In fact, the Navy has the, the Navy has said not only we cannot do without this, we cannot let the schedule slip. And also, and, and also, uh, at, at one point in the last administration, before Trump, President Trump's administration, the warning from the the warning out of the Chief of Naval Operations Office was this is going to bankrupt us. It's going to bankrupt our entire shipbuilding budget unless Congress does something to help us work around it. So again, this is so this is I mean this is something that is a potential budget buster and that we have to uh, keep an eye on and see how this progresses. And lastly, just a kind of a silly kind of a silly way to ex to explain that we spend a whole lot on manpower relative to our rivals. If anybody used to watch Top Gear on BBC or the Grand Tour when it moved over to uh, Netflix, I think it was. I mean, if you think it, they they always had these uh, these expensive uh, professional race car drivers driving these hyper cars and supercars around. You gotta you gotta think that people like to stick. Their 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 uh, their in house race car driver are not low cost labor. Estimates estimates hold that the United States uh, or excuse me that China and Russia can put about eight or nine sailor soldiers and airmen or airmen into uniform for the price of one American. So again, that's, that's, that's another thing that really consumes, when, by the time you think about salaries, healthcare benefits, uh, pensions, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, good thing, it's a good thing that we take care of our people, but it does cost us. And that's something that, and that's something that's a, that could be a great equalizer in competition with China, especially since we have to go into China's backyard, which, which obviously confers many advantages on China, as we will explore the, on the back half of this. So to, to beat that one down, this, this lovely young lady would tell us, he who spends the most need not win. It's not a, it's not a guarantee. The next, uh, the next one, the next metric that you often see uh, for sea power is the idea that he who weighs the most wins. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, so let's go, let's go through some of the greats who we've heard, heard comments on this, including this is, uh, this is Robert Kaplan, one of the greats uh, in the field of geopolitics. Uh, pictured, pictured on our stage in Spruance Auditorium, Auditorium back in 2014. He was back here in 2017 and he said this, the United States is a maritime nation. Let me summon out the key words. The Navy is the largest in the world by far. He goes on to, he goes on to say the coast, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't summon that one out. He goes on to say that the Coast Guard would qualify as the 12th largest Navy in the world. Well, we know that China's Navy is more numerous by, by many measures than we are today. And it, that was actually true back in 2017 as well. In fact, The Economist magazine about uh, eight or nine years ago put out a, a story that generated an enormous buzz by pointing out that in, in terms of major warships, China's Navy was already bigger than us even by then. Is that a showstopper? Not necessarily. The Soviet Navy was always much bigger than we were as well, but it is a, it is a uh, it, it does give you pause when you think about the rapid growth of the of China's Navy relative to ours, which has made remained more or less stagnant in recent years. But in any event, what does he mean by that? Well, I mean, he would get an argument uh, from my friend uh, uh, Jim Fennell, Captain Fennell, former a, a very outspoken former Pacific uh, Fleet intelligence uh, uh, officer, head of head of Pacific Fleet intelligence out there, who, who forecast in a book uh, out of our own CMSI a few years ago that China would have about a 500 ship navy by two th by 2030. So. He didn't make a strong prediction about that, but he, he quite clearly believes that that would be the case. So there's one reputable source who pushing back against this idea. 
But you can, you can want to others, some of the other really reputable and smart people in the field. This is Mike O'Hanlon down at the Brookings Institution. The Navy, yes, he, he rightly observes the Navy has chosen to put uh, more value, more technology into a fewer plat into fewer platforms, more expensive platforms. But then he comes to the same place as well. Our aggregate tonnage is still almost three times that of China. Okay, is that, does that mean that we win? Only if we're gonna be in a ramming contest. I mean, if you take that, if you take that logic to its extreme, the logic of superior tonnage, this is one of the strongest warships in the world. This is the Emma Maersk, got a, for, for the, working for the Maersk line, a 550,000 ton ship, about five or about five times that of the USS Gerald R. Ford, which I took, which I showed you a picture of a minute ago. That's obviously a nonsense statement. I mean, this is a civilian freighter and it's unarmed. But that's I mean, take it, taking this logic to its extreme, that's where it leaves you. You have to. You, you really get. You really got to add a, a whole lot more to that to, to that metaphor for this to really to really make much sense. Yes, it's. I mean, yes, yes. This indirectly indicates that we have certain advantages. Our ships are bigger. They carry more fuel, more ammunition, more stores, and all that sort of and all that sort of thing, which they have to do because we're going to we, we anticipate fighting thousands of miles from home, whether it's uh, off the shores of Western Europe or in East Asia. So indirectly, indirectly, this is a meaningful thing, but you really, it really leaves out an enormous amount of context to the point of where it's almost meaningless. I mean, think about it. Do, do you think uh, Coach Belichick is, is, is recruiting this guy for the for the offensive line for the Patriots? I mean, he's probably bigger and he's probably bigger and heftier than anybody on the team. But one one doubts that his ability to block or run a or run a football is very good. If you take, if you want to continue on with Mar with the sports metaphors, if it's somebody like this though, I mean, a big a, a big beefy guy. He's got lots of combat capability and can give his adversary a wedgie. If we can give China's Navy, Navy a wedgie, that, I'm all I'm all about that. So, but but the, I think this I think this picture does help you ask the right uh, the right questions. What are we actually getting for all that gross tonnage? Are we actually getting combat uh, capability, or is it or is it just sort of uh, more or less meaningless? So um, this is this is one way to think about that. She'll, but and she'll remind us again: he who weighs the most need not win in action. Okay, the next uh, zombie that you might encounter would be would be something like this: numbers of hulls. Let's count numbers of hulls and uh, figure out who has more, whoever whoever has more hulls in the water wins. And this is a, this is actually one of. The, in fact, I'm kind of surprised. I think just because it's such, it's such an unusual year and such an unusual election, you actually haven't heard too much of this uh, in this particular election cycle. But it normally comes up. The, the 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 idea that numbers of hull means or numbers of hulls mean everything versus the idea that they mean very little at all. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a from here, from the from the from the run up to, to the 2016 election. Here's how what Politifact had to say, and this is and I would I would indeed agree with them that this is a talking point. The smallest navy since 1917. What is that? What, what are we talking about there? That's a, that's basically the idea that we have. Uh, the smallest number of ships in the fleet since, that we had since the Naval Expansion Act of 1916, when Woodrow Wilson was pre was president, and when the United States uh, was still a regional fleet and was only then embarking to, on on the pathway to become a global navy. So that's a, that, I mean that's a pretty strong uh, statement, and they're they're essentially pur purveyors of this talking point are essentially saying we're on, we're on the on the verge of reverting to not being a global navy anymore. Yes, yeah, so, so like I said, a pretty a pretty a pretty uh, startling statement to make. Let me move on here, and this is, I mean, this is something. This is a way of looking at that has continued on to the present day. This is a uh, this is a picture a picture of David Perdue, a Republican of Georgia, senator from Georgia. Again, it, it, this is a, this, this was during the 2018 the 18 election cycle. But again, smallest navy since World War One, solely a solely a function of counting holes in the water. Here's what, uh, and it, like I said, this is a debate that goes back, it goes back certainly years and probably probably decades as well. This is what Secretary Mavis, or our Secretary of the Navy for the entire Obama presidency had to say. He's pushing back, he's, he's pushing it back against this idea that the number of holes is very, very important. And here's what he, here's what he has to say a few years ago. He says, well, the, the 1917 comparison is pointless because Today's ships are much more technically advanced, technologically advanced, which is undoubtedly true. I mean, would you take would you take, take today's navy in a battle with the Great White Fleet of Teddy Roosevelt? Uh, yeah, I think that, I think they'd have a pretty, they'd have a pretty good shot since the Great White Fleet would never get in range of our carrier air wing, let alone of our uh, anti ship missile batteries and all that sort of thing. So that's a, that's indisputably true. But what what the, what the purveyors of this particular talking point never point out is 
that yes, ships have gotten a lot more advanced, but the but the the threat environment has gotten a lot lot more menacing, as we will see as we will see for the rest of the lecture here. It is not 1917. You have to you have to interpret things like hull, hull numbers, combat capability in the context in which they will be used. We're not we're not going out to fight in 1917. We're going to have to fight in 2020 against things like this. This is a, this is an early model of uh, China's J20 uh, stealth fighter, uh, which will reportedly. Uh, eventually be added to the to the carrier air wings that China is busily developing as it constructs carriers uh, for use in the China Seas and the Indian Ocean. So you get you get you get the idea. There's a so no, numbers. Yes, they're important. Certainly, mass is important. Any any strategist knows that. But at the same point, you can't just use it as a talisman, as a, as a one stop or a one shop stopping way to measure naval power. So again, we need to we need to we need to combine a lot of these different metrics together. And try to and try to figure out, and then we need to measure ourselves in war games, such as we do a lot in Newport uh, uh, against actual competitors, and thus figure out whether we have enough sea power in order to get our job done. So no, numbers are not everything. The next, the, the next, and I think the last fallacy that I'll go through with you is it's sort of like this: it's the Jane's fighting ships way of looking at sea power. If you want to figure out whose navy is stronger, you, you, you do what I just said. You, you crack open your copy of Jane's Fighting Ships, you look at the pages for the, the PLA Navy, the, the, uh, uh, for, for the US Navy, compare them up, see who has more stuff and better stuff, and that, and that tells you who wins. It's all about ships and it's all about fleets. That, 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 was one, that's, that was one time, or it was true at one time. Sea power at one time was mostly about ships, unless, you, unless during the age of sail, you went in really, really close to a fort that had guns that could out, that could out shoot you because, uh, uh, simply because, simply because the, the, the land power had the advantage, even back in those days, if you got close enough. But for the most part, you could detour around it. I think that I think that behind this fallacy, I think there is, is, is imagery like this. This is one, it's a famous painting out of the Battle of Jutland in 1916 in which the, the, the Royal Navy's fleet, uh, Grand Fleet stood out to sea, well out to sea, to meet the German, the German high seas fleet. They were out of range of any land-based uh, munitions, and they had a gunfight. It was a solely fleet-on-fleet -fleet affair. So that's, and that's, that's of course, is a kind of an out, outdated way of thinking about sea power these days, because, as we know, all by, already by World War II, the, the air, naval aviation was becoming a thing. Land-based uh, aviation was becoming able to strike out the sea. This logic is this logic has really really started to break down even a century ago, not long after Jutland. So thinking about thinking about sea battles in this term is, is deeply misleading these days, because battle inv involves a lot more than fleets nowadays. And in fact, in fact, it, it involves more than navies. Full stop. Land, air forces and even army even armies are now maritime services to a great extent, which is why you when you when you look at what the United States Army and Marine Corps and Air Force are doing, a lot of it involves shaving events at sea, which is a beautiful thing. That's how that's how that you that that's how I hope we will offset some of the shortcomings that we see in our own force structure. Look at I mean think of just a few representative things. This is a line of Chinese uh, PLA Air Force jets armed with the anti-ship cruise missiles, able to strike out 100 miles out, of, out to sea against moving US Navy or allied formations at sea. This is an arm of sea power as surely as, a, as, as an aircraft carrier or a cruiser or a destroyer. So again, if you're going into somebody else's backyard, they're gonna have this sort of thing at their disposal. But it's, it doesn't really stop with manned aircraft. This is the uh, DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missile, the world's uh, first working such missile. A missile that is mounted on trucks, as you can tell about, so it can move around and not be uh, uh, attacked by our forces easily, and can strike, according to the Pentagon, about 900 uh, nautical miles off China's coastlines. I'll show, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of geography here and see exactly what that means. But it doesn't even stop with that. Uh, back in 2000, uh, 2015, the PLA Navy, or the PLA, the PLA Navy, uh, uh, during a parade in, in Beijing, as I'm showing here, introduced the DF-26, which are, is a, a, another anti-ship ballistic missile, reportedly with the ability to strike over 2,000 nautical miles offshore. That, 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 puts, it, that puts it able to hit, beyond, hit, hit targets beyond Guam, beyond the second island chain that uh, parallels Asia's coastlines, which, as you can imagine, that's a, that's a pretty significant thing. If our Pacific fleet is trying to steam across the Pacific to join up with forces in Japan and elsewhere in the region, uh, and form a fighting force that can that can defeat China or deter China. So again, this is this is something that uh, preoccupies people in, in my field in our field. Here's a here's 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 a diagram that shows that shows exactly what I just said. This comes out of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, and it's a it's a wonderful graphic. The, the important curves here are number one and number six. So they're the innermost and the outer outermost curves. 
that depicts the, re the, the reach of the DF21D and the DF26. So as you can see, it's unfortunately, unfortunately, they kind of they kind of kind of grayed out the geography a little bit. But the with the DF21D, they can hit well beyond Taiwan or Japan. Good a good way to blunt the blunt the force of an impact of our forces closing in on 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 Western Pacific. And then, man, look at that look at that curve number six there. That that extends well well beyond Guam, as well as being able to range the entire Bay, Bay of Bengal, the vast majority of the Arabian Sea, and well into the Gulf of Oman as well. Without even, without even deploying anything beyond Chinese soil, they can do that within their within their own frontiers, as, as indeed we've seen demonstrated just this year. So this is a so this is a I mean this is a problem. It's not just a matter of matching up the PLA Navy force structure against our own and seeing who has more stuff, better stuff, better people. They we we have to think in terms of going up against a joint Chinese sea power force. And that's a, that's something that you that oftentimes gets lost in, uh, especially in politicized debates in Washington and places like that. But it just doesn't even stop there. Uh, China, Ch China's, in fact, I would describe the early focus of uh, China's naval buildup as a as a force of uh, pretty pretty impressive diesel electric submarines, all all uh, armed not only with torpedoes but also with anti ship missiles. As indeed is this is this force of uh, stealthy stealthy catamarans Hobe, Hobe catamarans which also bear eight anti-ship missiles uh, apiece things that can fan out into the western pacific and, and potentially give us a hard time as we approach whatever the combat theater happens to be so again these are, this is a force that is designed to slow us down to weaken us before we actually even have a battle as, as, as the marines like to say we're going to have to fight to get to the fight and that's and that's by, by design uh, for force designers in china and I think it's a pretty impressive strategy and a pretty impressive force that they've come up to, 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 to challenge our ability to get into the region. I like this one. I believe this one. This is actually kind of an old one, but it's, uh, I, I like it. It's, it's really lurid. It's, it sort of suggests that we get into a yellow zone long before we approach the, the, uh, the Asian shorelines and what, you come within reach of more and more things as you actually get into the combat theaters, which would presumably be in places like Ta the Taiwan Strait, Senkaku Islands, uh, you'll notice the South China Sea is pretty, is pretty red, it would be even more so today because this dates from before the island building project, uh, which started in 2013. So it gives, it, gives you a, it gives you a sense of what we're up against as we try to go out and execute our strategy. I mentioned the island building, the island reclamation projects. These have all, these have all been dug up, dug up from uh, uh, islands and reefs and atolls in the South China Sea. Uh, equipped with airfields and, 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 made, and made ready to host aircraft and ships, and thus extending China's ability to mount a presence in the South China Sea well, well, well seaward of its shorelines and make things as tough, not only on us, but especially on its uh, Southeast Asian neighbors who are, who are really the focus of all that. I used to get, uh, I used to get uh, sn sort of snickers. This used to be sort of a laugh line. I, uh, around 2012, when we, get, when we first saw the Philippines get into a, a tussle with China over Scarborough Shoal at that point off uh, off their coast, I used to I used to describe this as the vanguard of Chinese sea power. I don't get laughs much anymore because we know, we know for a fact now, including through the efforts of people at CMSI, the China Maritime Studies Institute, that that China indeed operates a maritime militia within the fishing fleet. So this is very much a dual purpose fleet. Yes, it goes and catches fish and does the economic stuff, but it is also responsible to the Chinese military. Uh, and it's very much an arm of Chinese sea power. We can talk more about it that, at the, uh, the Q&A if you like. It's really, it's really quite fascinating and it's a really hard strategy to beat uh, for a lot of reasons. But, the, but, but again, any implement for China that can shape events at sea is an implement of sea power. We really need to keep that in mind. The strongest fleet need not win the strongest force when you add in all the components that, that are able to mold events on the high seas or in the skies above, that is what is going to win. And determine, determine the course of, of Asia, Asia and the in the Indo-Pacific uh, in, in the future coming day, coming years and decades. I would just leave, I would just leave you before we round this off and start looking at some geography with a, with, with a quote from the wonderful Albert Einstein, who tells us about net assessment. Not everything we can count counts. Not everything that count. Not everything that counts can be counted. So there are intangibles that it's really hard to that it's really hard to measure measure using numbers and metrics and graphs and that sort of thing. And he's, he's basically he's basically telling us to keep those things in mind because uh, it's, it's it's natural to count what you can count and and, and conclude that that's okay. Not necessarily. I think, I think that's I think that leaves a lot of important things out there we're out of the out of the discussion. So that's the end of the zombies. We as you can see they've been coming at us uh, hard uh, pretty pretty thick for about half an hour here. 
sum up all the bad ideas or all the partial ideas that I've gone through with you. And you, you get it, you get statements like this from people who really ought to know better. John, this is John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago, one of the greats in my field uh, of international relations. In his very well, well regarded book, uh, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, a few years ago, he essentially said this the United States Navy is 10 feet tall. How do I arrive at uh, that interpretation? Well, here's the here's the actual here's the actual passage out of the introduction to that book, which again is one of is one of the landmark works in my field. Here's what he says about China, and just in just in passing, China in present day China does not possess significant military power. That kind of goes against everything that I've been saying to you, and, and anything that you read in the defense or trade press. I mean, that's a we we know that China has done pretty well. Look at the second half of the sentence. And he, th- he seems to think that he's restating what he said in the first half of the sentence. Its military forces are inferior to those of the United States. Well, I mean, it's a, it is possible to be inferior to your adversary and yet still be not only have significant military power, but have war winning military power. And I think that's the case with China. And I think that I think that uh, Professor Mearsheimer has lost sight of that. It doesn't necessarily matter whether we as a whole are stronger or weaker than our adversary. It matters whether we are stronger or weaker at the place and at the time where battle takes place. And that's, a, that's, a, that's something that I think gets lost in this analysis. Beijing would be making a huge mistake to pick a fight with the US military. Well, I mean, I, th- I think it's. I think that's uh, that might be true in certain circumstances, but I think in the mo- in the most likely circumstances, that is definitely not true. To Taiwan only sits ninety miles off the off the ta- off the Chinese shorelines. I mean, that's a, is that is that is that a place in which uh, Beijing would be making a huge mistake to think that it might win? Yeah, it's a, I'll I'll leave that to you to to ponder. Okay, so let's turn let's turn to the closing, and I promised you some maps. I, I, lo- I love maps. I usually lead with them, but it didn't seem to work quite into the narrative here. So we'll, we'll hit we'll hit up the maps at the, here at the end. Why is it so hard to do this? Why are away games? The United, it's, it's commonly said that the U.S. military only plays away games. We go to the rimlands of Western Europe. We go to the rimlands of South Asia or, or East Asia, and that's where the fights happen. And that and that makes things really hard on us. Why is it so hard? Well, let's, uh, let's go back to the uh, the master of strategy, Karl von Clausewitz. He uh, he says something that's sort of like uh, you know, don't take any wooden nickels or you know, buy low, sell high type stuff. The best strategy is to be very strong, be like Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, or The Rock or something like that. And that's I mean, and that and that is certainly true. It's best to be stronger on the whole than your adversary. Have a bigger military, a more powerful military, more numerous, and all, and all the other measures. But then it gets a, but then he makes it more interesting. Yes, it's good to do that in general, but the main thing is to do it at the decisive point, the place where the action takes place. If I'm strong, if I'm stronger at, at, at point A and the fight takes place there, I'm going to win. It doesn't matter whether I'm stronger on the whole or not. I usually, normally when I come to this point in the auditorium, I normally look out in the crowd. And so, and so I'll look out virtually at you all and point out that there's, uh, how many people are there? 164 people in the room right now. Clearly, I would have no chance against all 164 of you if, if you came at me in mass at a particular decisive point. But you know what? If I can if I can find a good place of battle that actually suits my aims, and if I can take you one on, on uh, one by one, I might actually have a chance. I might actually have a chance to be stronger than the force that you put into battle at a particular place in time. Especially if I bring my baseball bat, or I use, I use a walking stick. I can actually I can actually use that to help get the, to help get the drop on you. So you get the sense. It all it all it all it all depends on the relative correlation of forces right at the decisive place in time. In fact, Clausewitz goes on to say, and he he doesn't he doesn't want he I mean he wants to be strongest at the decisive place in time, and therefore he cautions very strongly against dividing your forces to try to do lots of things. The United States we famously try to do everything in the world. He's cautioning against that. He sets a very high standard for breaking concentration. He wants you to keep the force together as much as possible so that you are stronger at the decisive place in time. He goes on later later on in his book. He says, well, you know, you need to handle your forces with such skill that even the, in the absence of absolute superiority, again, sort of a, sort of a, on the whole superiority, you need to be you need to be stronger at the decisive place. And if you are, that's enough. You are sufficient. So we, may, we might sum this up by saying, to get your, to riff on a bumper sticker you used to see here in New England, we can be globally inferior, but locally superior. And in fact, if you read back into the 19th century, the late 19th century, that was exactly what the Teddy Roosevelt's in the hands of the world wanted to do. 
They didn't need to, we didn't need to outbuild the Royal Navy. We didn't need to outbuild the, the Imperial German Navy. All we needed was a force that could command the Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the waters immediately off our Atlantic and Pacific coast. That was what we cared about back then, and therefore that was enough. And we could do that without outbuilding them as, as you know, running a, an open-ended naval arms race. So that's a, so it's, it's, it's something that China, in fact, that China studies our history, and, and sometimes I think they know, know it better than we do. And I think this is a lesson that they've taken to heart. Now, if we take all that, if we take all this and apply it to the actual theater, here's the Pacific theater. I love the, I love this image out of, out of the uh, Google Earth because you can barely see any land. I see you can see Alaska up here, the first island chain coming down on towards Taiwan, and you get the sense it's a, it's a very very maritime theater. It, it tends it tends you just it tends you to to break that Clausewitzian law and disperse forces. And I think that's a that's a danger that Clausewitz and, Mar and Mahan and other and other uh, maritime theorists, that strategic theorists, would go warn us to guard against because we know that zombies can go underwater. We, we cannot escape them by going to the Western Pacific. We're going to encounter these things over and over again, and need and need, and need to need to take them into mind or take them into, into account when trying to figure out how much sea power is enough. How do I mean that? Well, the the Pacific Ocean is a big theater. Here's a here's a map here's a map out of uh, out of the Fortune Atlas of World Strategy from 1944 I think 1943 or 1944 and it depicts Imperial Japan's claims in the Western Pacific which sort of roughly which sort of roughly parallel what China I think has in mind when it looks at the at the region today let me let me let me sum it out the let me sum out sum it out the external perimeter that Japan had in mind it basically wanted to enclose the Western Pacific and make that a Japanese preserve the co prosperity sphere as they took to calling it uh, later on in the conflict. That's a big theater. I mean, look at all that water, especially if you juxtapose it back against that uh, Google, the Google Earth image I just showed you. That's a lot of water. But there is a big, bigger theater. Let me say, let me show, let me show you again on this map, on this polar projection out of Nicholas Spikeman's Geography of the Peace. That's a that, that's basically where China's interests lie within within the first island chain, and then to a lesser extent out to the second island chain. That's a that's a big theater, but it's also a small subset of the theater theater for U.S. maritime and allied maritime endeavor, which is this. We think that we, we have interest pretty much in every expanse of water on the globe, especially in the northern hemisphere, but also in places like the South Atlantic and places like that, as, as well as the Indian Ocean. So as, if, if you, as, you, as you juxtapose those two things against each other, and as, you, as you look at the range of U.S. interests that, uh, that presidents of various administrations have posited, man, we tend to fragment our forces all over the place. Putting a, putting four destroyers in the Mediterranean Sea, you know, doing things in the Baltic Sea. I mean, that's it. it the the tendency to violate that clause in law and and break away from concentration is intense when you're a superpower, a global power like ourselves, as we've been at least since 1945. So, if you look if you look at Moses, aka AKA Charlton Hester from way back when, man, he can come down and bring the tablet all he wants to. Stay concentrated, but it really is not that easy to do. If you think if you think about uh, some other some other aspects of this, I mean, what happens? Let's uh, let's suppose that the United States military, what we can put into the theater, if we were if we were willing to give up all those interests across the globe and actually do the Clausewitzian thing, mass in the Western Pacific, and 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 be able to overpower the Chinese military, that brings up heavy heavy opportunity costs. Uh, with, with with regard to uh, basically giving Russia potentially free reign in the in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you can you can just you can just list all all the all the priorities that you want to that we would have to forego in order to mass all of our forces in the Western Pacific to make this happen. What, you could even get, I mean it could even be things like uh, counter piracy in the Gulf of Guinea off the Western African coast might be something that uh, that would go uh, go without being tended. So again, and that's the and that's the logic of uh, that's the logic in which China has has conscripted for its own maritime strategy. It counts on our not putting all of our forces into the combat theater at the right place in the right time. And I think that's pretty. That's a pretty sound uh, guess at, at, at what Washington will do in the future. So we have to figure out how to work around that. It's hard to it's it's hard to mass forces in the Western Pacific, also for very basic reasons. They're very far away. Look at look at this map. Another another map out of the Fortune Atlas from 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 World War II, in which it's depicting how far in the in the routes that forces going from the East Coast and the West Coast have to take in order to even get into the combat theaters around the world. Well, it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's long and circuitous. I mean, look at that one right there. If you want to use the Mediterranean route, boy, not only is that a long and convoluted route, but that's potentially contested by our adversaries 
if, if we try to mass in the Indian Ocean or the Western Pacific. So again, the distance, distance really matters. The potential for adversaries to make things hard on you as you go, as you try to get to the theater also is something we have to take into account as well. This is, a, this is a picture of Pearl Harbor from way back in the good old days when we used to, back in the late Cold War, when we used to have enough ships that we could nest them four or five abreast. That was kind of cool. You get the idea. I mean, think back to that budget question. We have, we have to maintain naval stations all over the place to, just to get to the theater so that we can support ships as they're making, ships and aircraft as they're making their way to, to a contested battleground that, uh, where we might face off against the Russian Navy, but especially against the PLA Navy and supporting arms of joint sea power. In fact, this is my, this is my favorite image. Uh, for thinking about how hard it is to project sea power out to out to sea, this is a, this is an artist's rendering of the uh, of the inverse squares law from physics. Basically, says when you when you when you radiate light or some some form of some form of energy, the uh, it doesn't the, it doesn't the amount of or the intensity of the energy doesn't dwindle sort of slowly and gradually. It goes down by the square of the distance. So right here, the the the, the, uh, the intensity is already one quarter what it was at the source. Take it another increment, it's one ninth. It's really, really hard to project uh, sea power out, out to sea, sea and air power out to sea, and therefore you need booster stations, which is, you can also think of uh, bases like Pearl Harbor, uh, Yokosuka, whatever the case may be, as being booster stations to try to boost that signal so that you can actually get military power to, to where it's needed when you're going very far from home. So again, Charlton Eston, whoever, who, Clausewitz, whoever you want to talk to, it is really hard to, to obey that Clausewitzian law and remain concentrated so that you can be stronger at the right place in the right time. This, uh, this, I mean, so these are sort of the obvious obstacles, distance, uh, distance, uh, and all these sorts of things. But this uh, that actually leaves, a part, uh, leaves aside probably the most important thing, and that's the fact that the adversary is not a potted plant. We cannot say that we cannot simply assume that China will let us come into the theater in order to enter to array ourselves for battle and get and get ready for them. Clausewitz tells us that uh, war, it's an interactive thing. It's about, it's about a collision of two living forces, both of which, not just us, both of which have an intense desire to win. They have ingenuity. In the case of China, it knows the battleground better than we are likely to. There are simply a lot of advantages that are going to go to defending your own environs, your, your own immediate uh, backyard. Here's a, this, is a, this is General uh, Paul Van Riper, kind of a hero to, to a lot of us here, here at the college. Uh, Van Riper was in, he, he basically played Iran back in 2002 in an, in an exercise, called, exercise called Millennium Challenge. He was basically allocated the resources of Iran back in those days, which were pretty slender. And he, he used them so creatively. He was such a creative red team that he actually managed to defeat a U.S. Navy carrier task force operating out, of, out, in, the, uh, out in the Persian Gulf. So it's, I mean, this, this, this to me is a metaphor for how we should assume our adversaries that will be, they will be resourceful, they'll be creative, they'll fit. I mean, he was doing things like pa passing a combat, a combat orders through, uh, through mosques. And I mean, it just, 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 just wild sort of stuff. What, so you can take the electronic stuff away from them, but they can still figure out how to work around it. So it's, I mean, it's, so that again, a very resourceful adversary. Oh, just as a sideline, you know what? Do you know what happened after that? After that round, the Navy changed the rules so that uh, so that Van Riper couldn't win, so he so he quit. So can't can hardly blame him for that. Kind of a danger of war gaming. This is a matter for. I mean, when you think about going into somebody else's, in this case, dojo, you're going into somebody on somebody else's turf to fight. We have to be like the great Bruce Lee, who ventured into his adversary's dojo in the fists of fury, and he had to go in there and pound him. And he actually won. Of course, he's Bruce Lee. Come on, and that. Uh, yeah, we have to ask ourselves whether we are Bruce Lee. Can we go into China's dojo and hope to fare as well against against the against the representatives of that, of that just the way he did back in the, in the 1960s and 1970s? Stick with the sports metaphors. What what else, what other advantages go to the home team? This is the this is the stadium at Texas A&M University, which claims to be the inventor of the 12th man. Basically. You know, basically having the home crowd. I mean, think about all the moral advantages, but think about how intimidating that is uh, for, for the adversary. Think about how, how, how good it is to know your own home turf. Uh, there might be some quirks of the field and so forth. So there's a, so there's, there's quite, there's quite clearly advantages of being off, fighting off your own shores. You probably, you probably care more than your adversary about what goes on there. I mean, that's, that's just, that's just, that's just sort of, uh, uh, that's just, I don't know. It's just sort of reason that's a, that you care more about what happens in your own environs than, than your out, outsiders might do so. Or you could tell you, you could, how about how about Duke University? The the the, the, uh, the residents of Cameron Auditorium there are so fierce and so crazy. They actually call them the Cameron Crazies. You can they they actually they actually directly interfere with the with the opposing team's ability to, to do its work. 
football, they, they can try to drown him out so they, can, they can't call plays. There's just a lot of ways to, to mess with the adversary. And there are certainly military analogs to this. It's like to, to, to stick with one more, one more little bit of sporting. It's kind of it's kind of like a WWE wrestling match. There's nobody. This, this guy this, this guy looks pretty pretty pathetic trying to police this about. There is nobody in warfare who makes the teams be equal, equal in numbers or equal in weight class or characteristics. This is so if somebody if China has more has more stuff in, 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 available in the theater, it, it behooves China to throw all of that in there so that it can try to toss us out of the ring, hit us with a chair, whatever the case may be. So that's a so that's a that's a way to think about warfare. Is it's a it, it's it always behooves you to bring all of your stuff that you can so that you can overpower the opponent. There's nobody making sure. In fact, we often we often in the United States say we don't want to fight fair fights. We want to we want to have a technological overmatch as well as all the other advantages that you need to win. So that's a so I think this is kind of another silly example way to think a way to think about what we're up against in in, in the Western Pacific. The enemy gets a vote. This is a mantra in our department. Is this is a mantra at the War College. The enemy gets a vote in my in the success of my policy and my strategy, and the enemy the enemy is always going to cast the, that vote against me, and for its and for its own purposes and the use of the use of power to fulfill those purposes. So, it's a, so it's a, it's always a mistake if you assume that the adversary is an inert mass that, on which you can work your will. It's not the case. It wouldn't be the case if somebody came against us, and it's certainly not the case as we go up against a, a serious competitor like China. As we can close out. We can we can basically close that with a simple for I actually haven't mentioned Mahan much here, which is unusual for me. He sounds very Clausewitzian as well. He's trying to figure out how to size a fleet. How can we size our US Pacific fleet? So but sort of back to the question I posed at the beginning about the 60% number. He proposes what he calls a broad formula. The fleet must be great enough to take to the sea and to fight with reasonable chances of success the biggest fleet that it is likely to brought, or excuse me, is likely to be brought against it. The, the largest force that it is likely to meet in battle. Break that down just briefly. Great. So it, 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 it sounds like it sounds like another one of those uh, buy low, sell high type of type advice pieces. Yeah, but, uh, it, it's, it, there's actually a lot here. Man, Mahan was not known as a master wordsmith, but I think that there, there's really a lot of content here. The fleet needs to be great enough to take on the largest. This sounds like net assessment. This sounds like measuring numbers of hulls, measuring the capabilities of weapons, all of that kind of thing that helps one force square off against another. Reasonable chances of success. There's, a, there's an element of risk. How much, how much risk is each side willing to run in order to, in order to get it, its aims in battle? So there's an element of risk. There's also an element of uh, politics. How much, does it, how much does each contender care about winning? If it doesn't care that much, it's probably not going to commit a lot of all of its forces. If it cares a whole lot, it's going to throw everything it has into the fight for as long as it takes. So that's that's how, so that geopolitical calculation is a huge aspect of this, and that's where the likelihood comes in. Think think about it. Look out from Beijing into the Western Pacific and try to get, try to gauge what is the largest force that President Trump or whoever wins next week is likely to put into battle in the Western Pacific. That's the standard of adequacy for the PLA Navy and for the, PLA, for, for the PLA Air Force and for strategic rocket force, all those forces that we went through. If, they, if, we're willing, if, if President Trump's willing to send a whole lot, that's, a, that's the measure of our adequacy. If, they, if, if, if uh, President Trump is not willing to sacrifice heavily, if the American people are not willing to sacrifice heavily on behalf of, the, of Taiwan or whatever the case may be, they will commit less and that, may, and that becomes the standard of adequacy for the PLA. And that's what they need to measure against. And, that's, and I, think that's, I think that's quite clear in Chinese strategic thinking. So to take that Mahanian formula and try to neck this down toward, toward the end, compare forces, do the stuff that we do the stuff that, that I went over with all the zombie discussions. But again, then it becomes interesting. Think about cost to each side. Think about opportunity cost for each side. That's a lot squishier, but it's but it is equally important. And think about how much risk each side is willing to run. China is willing to let, run a lot of risk because it sees these these goals that it has set forth as per, of permanent and pressing importance to China, reaching all the way back into the 19th century, a century of humiliation for China. So quite, China has vested a lot of importance in these things, and I think we have to we have to contend with that. So really, when you when you when you really break it down, this is the question that we have to pose for ourselves: Who wins when a fraction of U.S. forces goes up against an adversary's entire navy, potentially, entire air force, potentially, and the army, of which of which the strategic rocket force is an outgrowth? So 
we, we really have to think about that. And we can talk during the Q&A, we can talk about how we might try to, how, how we might try to overcome these problems and what the, what the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard and our joint, uh, our joint uh, friends are all trying to do to make, the, to make this happen. But in any event, so when you, when you, when you listen to commentary over the next week or whenever this uh, comes up, just to, I mean, just to let the buyer beware. You always ask the tough questions when you hear these really simple metrics uh, trotted out to, to explain how we are inevitably going to win, we are inevitably going to lose, whatever the case may be. And you, you do that, I think you'll be well equipped to, to uh, take part in these discussions and make, and make wise decisions moving ahead. So I've thrown a lot at you, and I, I, hope, I hope that I've helped uh, fuel some thought, and I would love to take your questions now. Hey, Jim, thank you very much. As, as always, a superb presentation that scares the heck out of people, uh, even without the zombies. But <clears throat> unfortunately, we only have a few minutes for questions here, and we've had many, many questions come in. But let's just throw one out, uh, and that's uh, the notion of uh, are we properly investing in large deck nuclear-powered aircraft carriers that seem to be particularly vulnerable or are we better served with some other uh, force uh, situation, including unmanned systems? Yeah, it's a, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's really sort of, I mean, that's one of the big questions. That's an extremely well-posed question. The, and I, the, I, can, I can tell you what Secretary Esper, I mentioned Battle Force 24, uh, 2045 right at the beginning. The, the, design that, the design he has proposed and that the White House, I don't think is approved yet. It, may, it probably won't before the election, but the idea is that you would scale back the number of CVNs, nuclear powered aircraft carriers to eight or nine, I think was the, was the figure. And that you would supplement that with, I think six, I think they said half a dozen of a small, they're calling them light aircraft carriers, basically offshoots of the American class uh, helicopter carriers, which can now carry uh, F-35s, sort of a jump, vertical jump jet air, air, F-35. So, so you, they're, they're basically saying you rebalance towards a, a more numerous, but lighter carrier force. The other half of that, the other half of that is, is what the Navy's doing under is since about 2015 uh, has been pursuing what it calls distributed lethality, or they're now calling it distributed maritime operations. This is basically the idea that you have lots more numerous ships. Uh, they may be they may be smaller or lighter, but they will all still pack a heavy punch. And you put you put missiles on everything. You basically put uh, anti-ship weapons, anti-air weapons on anything anything that floats, whether it's a it could obviously a cruiser or a destroyer, but also an, amph an amphibious war, an amphibious warship, or even, or even a tanker or something like that. So you really give the adversary, you give the adversary a lot more to think about. You also, you, you, the basic idea is that you improve the ability of the force to fight on, even though you're going to lose individual ships and individual units. So you, you made yourself resilient and thus improve the, improve your chances of actually winning, even though obviously you're going to lose some units in battle. I mean, that's just sort of the nature of what we do. So as far as, as far as unmanned, I think, I, I think that, uh, I think that Congress has not really been willing yet to, 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 to throw all its eggs in that basket, simply because we're still, in, in, we're still experimenting with these things. A question that oftentimes, and I don't know if this was part of this one, but a question that oftentimes comes up is, uh, I mean, are these actually going to, are they actually going to replace Traditional, tr tr traditional surface plot. I don't, I, I, my my gut instinct is probably no, because they, because it, I mean they, they, these are still mechanical things. They still break. They're going to need maintenance. It's it's kind of hard to see you putting one of these things out to sea for six for six months without maintenance and uh, uh, and repairs and so forth. But that's just that's just one guy's guess. And uh, there have been there has been there have been some uh, uh, promising things like uh, Sea Hunter has cruised from San Diego to to Hawaii by itself. So yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, that's just sort of my gut instinct as an old guy who was used to his sailors working on stuff all the time by themselves. Uh, another question is, uh, considering that uh, the U.S. has a very, very small merchant marine fleet and very few U.S. flagged uh, carriers, how do we justify spending that much money to basically protect someone else's uh, fleets? Oh, so there's two. There are basically two halves of that. I think I think I think you're actually the yeah, the, the merchant marine always comes up, and you're, you're quite right. It's too small. Everybody everybody knows it's too small. In fact, if you uh, if it's it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to nail down the numbers to to precisely calculate the number of the merchant marine, but it seems to be less than we lost in action in 1942 to the German U boats. So I think that that gives you at least a rough guide to to uh, to, to think about how big how big the merchant marine should be. If you look if you if you lose the merchant marine, we're probably going to lose the war because we're not going to get stuff and people to the places where they need to be when they need to be. 
Okay, so that's a, so that's just a, sort of the sort of the quick and dirty on that. As far as what, but talking about protecting allies, I think was the question. Well, I mean, look at the map. If you, I mean, what is our strategic position in the Western Pacific, Pacific without uh, without allies? You, you don't have Japan. You don't have South Korea. You don't have uh, uh, some sort of relations with Taiwan. You don't have you don't have uh, access to the Philippines. Where are we? Guam. That's about as close. That's about as close as you get. It's really hard to project power into into the into the waters and onto the shores in the in the Western Pacific from Guam. It's just a, it's just not big enough. It's all by itself. It can get pounded on by the PLA, whatever the case may be. In fact, they, the PLA uh, quite quite clearly calls a couple of those ballistic missiles I I called I showed you Guam killers, and that's a, that's quite clearly a message about that. So it is. And so if you're willing to withdraw to the Western Hemisphere, you go back to the 19th century or the or even the days before World War II. I guess that's that's kind of what that's kind of what we're positing that we would do. So it's really it's really hard to do. I mean, it's really hard to balance from from thousands of miles offshore, and that's really a strategic question that we would be uh, we we would be taking on if we had that national debate as a as a country. President Trump President Trump is uh, not hugely uh, not a huge fan of alliances. It doesn't seem like, let alone foreign wars. But I, at the same time, I don't think he's you haven't seen him threaten to shut down shut down our alliances. And I think that that would be a massive massive shift in U.S. policy and strategy. So. Well, Jim, uh, since we're at the uh, the end of our allotted time, do you have any final comments you'd like to uh, make before we uh, turn to our uh, family discussion group meeting? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you said something about how how dark a picture. I, I always paint a dark picture. I think I think that's I think that's a way of paying respect to our adversaries, which they are eminently due. I do I, I do I do think that uh, when you when you look at the at the, all these bad news stories, I mean, especially in recent years when we've had we've had a really rough ride in the surface navy in particular with uh, the collisions in 2017 and groundings, and then and then basically losing a. a it looks like we've actually lost a major amphibious warship to fire this year, burning right in the middle of San Diego. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a really tough go. But there's also a lot of good news things that are happening out there. The Navy, the Marines are talking about naval. They're talking about naval integration, basically joining their efforts so that we more for, more effectively fight in the theater where we may fight, which is the Western Pacific. So, in particular, General Berger, the, the new Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, is a real hero. I think he's actually driving this process. Uh, on the technology te the technology side, you're seeing new new technologies that will help reverse some of these problems. In fact, we've we're already seeing Air Force bombers and F-18 fighters off of aircraft carriers firing a new long-range empty ship missile, which will help correct a lot of the difficulties that we've uh, that, that we've encountered and that I've discussed or at least touched on briefly with you with you tonight. So you're talking about hypersonics and all this kind of stuff. So again, it's a competition. I think you would expect to see sort of a back and forth dynamic in the coming years, if not decades. So we, we have to we have to expect that there will, that there will be times when we're sort of uh, back on our heels. But it's uh, but at some times I think we will we will adapt and have China back on its heels. And I think if we can do that, I think we have a pretty good chance of, uh, of deterring them. So that's, I guess that would I guess that would be sort of a up, up, slightly uplifting closer for the for the talk tonight. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, have a good uh, Halloween and I hope the zombies don't bother you around your house. So. Thanks, everybody, for attending.